Hello and welcome to Principles of Cognitive Neuroscience Part A. As you may know, this module is divided in three parts. In the first part, I spoke about main models defining how the brain works. In the second part, we tackling main results that are reported in the literature. Those are main concepts that define a result that you will publish in your papers. Um, and in the third part, we're doing practicals hand on onto manipulating data, writing a paper, writing a project in order to get a grant, writing uh, a, a code in order to do analysis or building a new software and also learning about the life in academia. Today we will speak about brain plasticity. So what is brain plasticity? It is a way the brain can change over time. And this brain uh, will change differently uh, during its uh, maturation from uh, uh, your birth or in trying to in measurements to your adult age. And it will change also differently during your adult age as you learning new skills because those new skills will leave an imprint imprint in your brain um, characterizing the way you can achieve those new skills and then it will change again through aging and the way the way your brain age and cope with a, a progressive decline um, if you watched uh, the lecture about uh, glial cells and uh, glial models, um, you might know by now that a key, a key um, element that contributes to brain plasticity is, uh, uh, the, uh, gli are the glial cells. And uh, so, so I encourage you to rewatch this lecture in order to understand how at the biological level glial cells can change the anatomy, the shape and the functioning of your brain. Um, it is coming with this beautiful uh, um, story of the life of Marion Diamond and uh, during this video you'll see how she discovered that an enriched environment was increasing the thickness of the cortex and this was uh, mostly related to an increased amount of astrocytes in the cortex. Uh, she also demonstrated that the brain of Albert Einstein in the parietal lobe had a particularly large amount of astrocytes, uh, which would have suggested um, his intensive use of this brain region uh, which uh, uh, might explain how he was able to project himself uh, and using his mental imagination to project himself, the visualization he had of uh, problems. Um, but um, uh, without further ado, we're going to start uh, discussing about brain plasticity. Unfortunately, we have few information on uh, glial cells and there is no clear link, uh, particularly in humans, there is no clear link uh, between uh, glial cells in the biological measurement and uh, glial cells uh, uh, measured and derived by neuroimaging. Uh, so most of my lectures, uh, most of my lecture will be uh, uh, focused on uh, change in the neuronal population and a change in their connections, okay? Uh, so, you know, uh, you're born and your brain's gonna go through a maturation. And uh, um, so, like, you know, like the classical idea that people have is, oh yeah, brain maturation will be the progressive increase of neuron and connections in your brain. And um, it's actually not true. If you uh, look at this paper from uh, 1985, uh, that was made in uh, non-human primates, monkeys, 
Um, you can see that uh, if you look at the uh, synapses, the density of synapses and connection between neurons, um, it is actually the highest at birth, okay? And this is true whether you're looking in A, in the motor cortex, in B, in the somatosensory cortex, in C, in the prefrontal cortex, in D, in the visual cortex, and in E, in the limbic cortex. And uh, so that, that was done with electron microscopy, which is uh, probably uh, one of the highest resolution that we can have with a uh, biological sample. And, uh, and you can see how uh, you, um, you are progressively decreasing. So the highest is at first, and, and then like your amount of synapses progressively decrease, two months, four months, one year, three years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, it might look linear on this chart, that it is actually not linear, as you can see that uh, 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 like the, the time has been compressed and this, of course, uh, um, a log relationship. This is a log scale, so this is a log relationship. So next time uh, people you know are saying oh yeah your kids or your little brother is growing up uh he's building connections you'll be more no actually is pruning those connections so like the real question is why would we be born with more connection and prune it over time rather than building these connections so the hypothesis behind it is that if you're born with a lot of connections, through, through synaptic pruning, you will adapt better to the environment because the environment will be able to leave its imprint and carve your brain so that you are perfectly adapted. And uh, we can see how this can have an impact for uh, children, for example, that were living in isolation. If you take like a, a, a wild children that have been raised, you know, with in, in by themselves in the forest, um, if you have the chance to get them uh, very early, they can adapt to civilization. But if you get them like really late in life, they will never adapt as well as you had them early. And it's because uh, 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 the environment already carved uh, their brain in a given way, which is more adapted to the world. Another example is that like um, young children are very quick to learn new skills. Uh, usually you see that with electronic or my phone, I can give it to uh, my daughter on my son, he's two years old, he's already, he already knows how to walk through the phone and get onto YouTube Kids, which is his favorite app. Um, and he learns that at a speed that is unbelievable. On the other hand, my mother, who's uh, 70, is like more confused when she got a new tool. And that's because uh, uh, she carved away all these synaptic connections that would have been useful to learn how to interact with a new tool. Um, and now she has to learn it the hard way by finally tuning the connection that she has. Um, while actually my uh, kids are still uh, omnipotential and then uh, they can learn most of everything now. The so same example goes for learning a second language. Um, uh, so, you know, at home, like we speak two languages, English and French, because my wife is American. Uh, my daughter is four years old. She speaks perfectly French and perfectly English. And at four years old, she correct my English. And I've been learning how to speak this language for the past 20 years. Um, so you see how really this potential of having all those connections is really good for you to adapt to your environment 
and learn really fast new skills. Um, but then, you know, like what is not used in your brain is carved away. Um, importantly, you might say, well, but if we could find a way to keep all those synaptic connections in the brain instead of carving them away, and that's a really good question. And people that are studying brain maturation in psychiatric disease are looking at this as an abnormal maturation. And sometimes more connection is not good. More connection can lead you to uh, uh, a, a psychiatric condition. And so it's, it's really, you know, you can play, there is a reason why we have those connections. This is adaptation to the environment. And that's also define and optimize really your relationship with the environment. So this is uh, monkeys and this result has been uh, nicely uh, uh, replicated with neuroimaging, although not at the same resolution, by using voxel-based morphometry. Uh, authors were able to see that you have a progressive uh, decline in the gray matter concentration, whatever it means, between five and 20 years old. And you can see here how uh, the uh, red values are progressively reducing on the surface of the brain, leaving space for blue values. Um, then I got a little animation here, and you can see how uh, this change is uh, distributed differently across the brain with a uh, uh, First, as it looks, um, a change that will happen in the sensory motor cortex, cortices, and then that extend to the parietal, uh, prefrontal, and uh, superior temporal lobes. Uh, but, you know, like those are like studies from about 15 years ago. And uh, for a long time, it, you know, it's barely possible to have access to any of this data because it's really hard to scan uh, babies. Uh, like it's ethically really hard. It is practically really hard to keep them in the scanner. And then it's, it's really difficult to get participants because people just don't want to have their babies put in an MRI scan. Um, but fortunately, a recent initiative uh, from the European Research Council funded uh, the Developing Human Connectome, which will include uh, the scanning of uh, uh, babies, like uh, uh, we've been seeing here. But if you compare with the previous slides here, you see that um, uh, the youngest we had on these slides is five years old. But what does happen before that? So here you will have babies from the birth to uh, uh, five years old, uh, but you also have uh, fetal scans, which are scans of the brain of babies when they are still like before birth. And that's, that's an amazing window of understanding, window of vision onto uh, the development of the human brain and uh, probably new models and the possibility to understand new model of the normal development of the human brain in order to characterize and eventually uh, prevent disease in the future. What's great and why it is great that you decide to do research now or to orient your career in research now is all this data will be uh, an hour already for some of those uh, uh, free access for people who want to do a research. So if you want to assess, if you have a question and you want to assess it, or if you have a new method and you want to investigate it in uh, the brain of uh, a fetal scan or babies, you actually will be able to do it during uh, the future year. And you won't have to bother acquiring this data, spending years doing it because they are available and uh, by being available, it will boost our research and our findings. Now, you know, this is uh, 
this is a baby, but then, you know, like you go to uh, be an adult and as adults, we're not all exactly the same. We show individual differences and these individual differences are, you know, characterized, we think, by differences in our brain. Um, and uh, in, in this beautiful uh, research had been led by Heidi Johansenberg, uh, she's been able to show that according to how good you are in your manual coordination, the way you can uh, 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 do, for example, drums, um, so that was actually the test, uh, is proportional to the strengths of the connection in your brain between your right and your left motor cortex. So the more you can coordinate your skills, the better is your connection between your left and your right hemisphere, especially for the streamline that which the motor cortex. That's like probably one of the first demonstration that changes occur inside the white matter when you have a skill that others do not have. Like you have a direct relationship to the anatomy of your white matter and your ability to perform a skill. And so like this concept has been uh, further extended showing that people that are better in uh, uh, learning grammar also have a different uh, 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 white matter organization, higher level of white matter organization in the vicinity deep in the white matter of the broker area in the left hemisphere that you can see uh, uh, here in uh, highlighted in yellow. And, uh, and this demonstrates that individual differences in the organization of the white matter in the vicinity of the broker area can be related to a better performance in grammar learning. Now, really, the question behind that is, were you born this way with this difference, or did you change and, and or nature care, carve your brain, or you change it through use so that you have a different organization there that will lead you to have a, a better grammar learning success? Um, it is, it is the question um, and, you know, you can extend the question to the following example, which is applied to uh, uh, the measure of the performance in the blanket task of um, Royal Air Force pilots uh, compared to earthly control. So if you don't know as a flanker task, um, it's a simple task. You can see in A, you got to keep your eyes on the central fixation. The central fixation after uh, two seconds will be uh, uh, flanked with uh, arrows indicating the left or the right uh, direction. In that case, the arrows are indicating the right direction. And then 500 milliseconds later, you have a pair of arrows at the level of your fixation that will appear either in the same direction or in the opposite direction of those two arrows. This uh, task is controlled by a neutral uh, condition where instead of arrows, uh, your central point of fixation will be flanked with uh, two squares, not indicating any directions. And so you can see, uh, like, so your task is actually to press on the right button when the arrow are pointing towards the right and the left button when the arrows are pointing toward the left. And so what you can see in B, in healthy controls, 
is that uh, uh, when the arrows are congruent with the arrows that are flanking them, you are faster to press uh, the right button uh, than when uh, they are incongruent and going the opposite direction of the arrows that are flanking them, where you have a cost that is uh, called the incongruent cost. cost. Um, and so, and then like if you compare this with a neutral condition, you can see and you can extract uh, 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 a value, which is a benefit of having the arrows in the same direction that the direction you get a press, uh, which is like a form of uh, priming of your action. And the uh, difference with the incongruent will be the pure cost of having this incongruency. And the incongruence cost is usually measured as the difference between congruent and incongruent, and is composed of the benefit of the congruence and the cost of the incongruence. Okay. What we can see is that a pilot in general, so you will think like a, a, um, a Royal Air Force pilot will be so fast at uh, having as, as a reaction, so they're actually a little slower. And, uh, and they're slower because probably something different is happening in their brain when they have to uh, make a, a decision of uh, turning right or turning left. Um, and this is exactly what uh, Robert has been investigating. She's been uh, comparing the brain of the Royal Air Force participants and uh, 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 according to their performance with the one of controls and been running some regression to see what part of the brain uh, was related to uh, 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 this uh, specific uh, cost, increased cost of uh, reaction time when you are in the incongruent uh, uh, condition. And now like what you can see is that you do have, uh, um, you do have a relationship between uh, the parietal cortex and uh, the white matter in uh, the vicinity, well, it's actually the white matter in the vicinity of the parietal cortex and the uh, cost that is uh, related to the incongruency. And, uh, but you also have uh, some regions in uh, the uh, dorsomedial uh, frontal cortex where you have a positive relationship uh, between the white matter there and, and the benefit that you can have from the instructions of the arrows going in the same direction as uh, the direction that you got to choose. So you see really here, you have a fine tuning of the white matter organization in the brain uh, uh, that is that gonna be able to predict and characterize a difference in behavior uh, in uh, participants that are experts in a, in a given field, okay? Here it's like uh, piloting like a, you know, an, an, a plane. Same idea uh, from the same author, this time applied to a different field of expertise, which is uh, um, uh, the uh, ballistic movement, particularly in the uh, case of participants that are expert martial arts artists, um, compared with healthy controls uh, who didn't do any uh, martial art. And so like the way you can uh, measure uh, the expertise objectively is by uh, putting some captors onto their body and ask them to uh, hit as fast and as strong as they can uh, a plate, which is called a punch force uh, plate. 
um, and uh, derive from that uh, uh, different measurements uh, thanks to the captors. Uh, you can see uh, how fast it will move uh, relatively to the impact and that's in the uh, panel C. Uh, the impact being at zero, you can see the uh, move uh, first the uh, shoulder and that's why usually you say in the box people when boxing you look at the shoulder because you have this few milliseconds uh, cue that uh, the uh, boxer is going to hit you from the right or the left arm uh, followed quickly uh, by the hip and finally uh, the wrist uh, that will uh, go really fast into uh, the impact of the plate and what you can see is that like the speed of the movement is faster in martial artists compared to earthly controls. That's like in the panel D. Um, it is just faster. And uh, they're faster because some, somewhere in the brain, uh, uh, like the way the information is processed has been taking some shortcuts. And these uh, shortcuts have been investigating, again, using uh, diffusion weighted imaging, looking at the white matter organization. Um, uh, Roberts has been able to demonstrate that you have specific change that occur in the brain uh, related to this improved performance between experts and controls and those change are located in the cerebellum where you have uh, a, a lot of learned motor sequences and in uh, the uh, uh, premotor cortex in the white matter of uh, the supplementary motor area, motor area where you have uh, stored also motor sequences and so probably what is going on here we just see uh, a little part of it. It's part of an entire network of interconnections between those regions. It's just going slightly faster because it's been used a lot. Now, you know, uh, um, and those are like, uh, you know, like the improve of the level of reflex and the speed of matricity, like the motor impact that you can do that have been related to uh, increased uh, 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 connections. But it's not always related to speed. You've seen this slide before. Um, uh, you know, like we have a change that occur in the brain with evolution. We see it when we compare it between uh, different primates, including humans. Um, uh, so, and, and particularly the parietal and the temporal lobe expanded and the interconnection also expanded. Um, but really, uh, uh, why did it expand? The, the question is probably because in humans we acquired new uh, possibility of communication, including the symbolic communication, which is very well developed in humans. And, um, but, you know, not everybody uh, learns this symbolic communication. I'm, I'm speaking about reading. Um, and if they don't learn to read, uh, they still have a similar, uh, uh, the, the brain doesn't become the brain of a monkey, if you want. So it's somehow new functions that you're not born with uh, tend to recycle uh, uh, the anatomy of, of the brains that you have and colonize regions as you're learning it. It's been beautifully illustrated by the work of uh, Stanislas Dehaene and collaborators, where they compared the functional activation in the brain uh, related to the acquisition of literacy. And so they had the chance to uh, build this uh, uh, fantastic group of participants where they had uh, 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 illiterate uh, um, participants from uh, Brazil. Uh, they had, uh, which is a ILB group, they had literate participants from uh, 
uh, Brazil with the same social cultural level as a uh, illiterate uh, participant, which will be the LB2 group, and a literate participant from Brazil with a high level of social, so, so a high social cultural level, which will be the LB1. Um, and they also compared it with uh, literate participant from Portugal of comparable social cultural level with the LB1. Um, but that's not all. They also had the chance to investigate two additional group of participants that were illiterate but learn to read late in life. And those are the XP and XB group uh, will learn to read late in their life and that would be for the Portugal and the Brazil uh, participants. Um, why is there not illiterate group in Portugal? It's just because nowadays we did a pretty good job. It's really hard to find participants that are illiterate. Um, we did a very good job internationally promoting and teaching how to read to almost everybody. Um, as there's still some work, it's, you know, the pressure in the vicinity of some countries, we can still find people who cannot read and there's still some effort and some promotion to do. Uh, but I think it's a fantastic uh, finding that it was hard to find illiterate uh, people. It's, it's really great. Bravo us, and by us I mean humans. Um, so, if, you know, they scanned them and they showed it like uh, uh, known words and they asked them to read it. And, and really when you compare the pattern of activations between the people who can read and the people who cannot read and the people who learn to read late in life, you can see that of course the people who cannot read have a radical uh, different pattern of activation in their brain. They activate much less key regions such as the visual what from area, uh, the left superior temporal sulcus and the uh, left uh, frontal sulcus. And so this led to the idea that reading is actually uh, the conversion between the visual representation of syllables and the recognition of syllables in the visual work from area and the auditory uh, representation in the left uh, temporal sulcus to finally produce it in the left frontal lobe. Um, but the question here is, uh, so you got a change of functions, is this related to eventually uh, 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 so you get a change in the network of activation. Is this related to a change of a specific anatomical connections? And this is something that we investigated on this data set on the way we did it. So it, you know, in B, you have the typical regions that have been reported in the previous slide. We got V1, visual what from area, superior temporal sulcus, planum temporally, and some frontal regions and those those regions are very much interconnected by uh, by specific tracks and uh, these specific tracks we uh, we, uh, we looked at um, the fractional anisotropy so the density of the connections in regards to the performance at the reading uh, the reading task and uh, if you do so, actually one connection, really only one popped out as very different in the, um, in the left hemisphere, the posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus that links, you know, this yellow one that links the posterior temporal lobe with the parietal lobe. Well, so dense is the more like the, the more water is uh, uh, restricted in the direction of uh, these tracks, suggesting more densely packed axons, the better you are at reading. And this difference is clear between the illiterate group and the literate group that shows a significant difference into like the uh, strength of this connection. 
but it also it is also different between the illiterate and the ex illiterate group showing that even late in life if you uh, uh if you learn to read you can still show some plasticity in your brain that will change its structure so it's not only happening between uh, zero and 20 years old if you learn around 40 you can still change as uh, the anatomy of your brain and learn a new skill nothing is going to be as easy as younger but it's going to happen and your brain will look like people who learn in their young age in terms of this uh, specific connection because there is no significant difference between the ex illiterate group and the literate group okay then we look at perpendicular diffusivity uh, which is another measure of uh, uh, the white matter connections supposedly being related to myelination but it's really discussed and uh, the um, the lower it is higher your myelination so one possibility is the change that happened in this track is related to an increased myelination of the connections that is that are, are connecting the uh, uh, posterior part of the temporal lobe including the visual world from area with the parietal lobe uh, which is uh, 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 supramarginal gyrus angular gyrus and uh, planum temporal which is really in between uh, parietal and temporal and uh, and this effect you know we looked at you know this could be like uh, an effect which is just one part of the track it looks like it's really and that's the lower part of the slide it's really happening uh, whether you're in the lower part of the posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus which would be region of interest one so you still have this difference it's also true for region of interest two which is a little higher region of interest three which is a little higher and region of interest number four which is is a little higher um, it is not true for the region of interest number five which is the highest so that will suggest that really the difference that happened that happened mostly uh, uh, between the connection between the visual world from area and the plenum temporally and um, so that was for the behavior and we try to look at whether uh, these connections were uh, related to uh, the level of functional activations and we found out that uh, the strengths of the posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus was significantly correlated with the strengths of activation when you're showing those no word to participant in the visual world form area where you have to represent those syllables together and uh, recognize that those are syllables of words and uh, uh, it was also uh, very much correlated with activation in the planum temporal day, where you have to represent the sounds related to uh, those uh, words that you just saw so the idea that we push forward with this paper because it is correlated with the visual world form activation and the planum temporal layer activation uh, uh, do, and it, it suggests uh, that uh, this connection is ensuring oh sorry I made a mistake And then we try to look at uh, whether or not this connection was uh, correlated with specific functional activations. And we look at a functional activation between the posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus and the presentation of, of written strings, like known words. And we find out that of all the regions, uh, uh, posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus was very much correlating with activation how responsive is a visual word from area to a uh, written string and the stronger your posterior segment the more you're going to activate your visual word from area for written strings and then we look at whether this track was 
uh, correlated with functional activation uh, during uh, spoken sentences, so like auditory. And we found that this track was also highly correlated with uh, uh, the level of activation in the plenum temporally during spoken sentences. And the stronger your posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus, the stronger you activate your plenum temporally during uh, listening of uh, spoken sentences. And because of this relationship between strength of the connection, level of activation for written string in the visual world for Maria, and level of activation when you're listening to spoken sentences, we push forward the idea that the relationship and the increase of uh, 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 the strength of connection uh, of the posterior segment between those regions was related to the conversion of written strings into auditory representation in the plenum temporally. Now, um, correlations in the language level also exist a little further. Uh, in uh, the long segment of the arcuate fasciculus, not when you read something, but when you learn new words. And you can see how you have a different system of uh, connections that will support the acquisition of new uh, language and new words. And here you can see uh, uh, clearly how uh, uh, the word learning performance is related to uh, 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 a reduced radial diffusivity, uh, which is supposedly related to uh, an increased uh, myelination of the arcuate fasciculus. So it is significant in the left hemisphere. It is not significant for the other part of the uh, 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 arcuate fasciculus, uh, which are the anti and the posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus. This word learning was also related to the level of functional connectivity between the broca area and the vernic area. So you remember functional connectivity, you're not looking at tract, you're looking at the coherence, the correlation at rest of the activity in uh, uh, a given region and the activity in another region. And we can see here that the level of correlation uh, between uh, uh, the level of the Z score of the, of the uh, relationship, which is a conversion of the R Pearson into a Z, Z score, is a very strong uh, 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 between Broca and Wernicke and the level of performance in word learning. And this relationship here is 0.57. And so you can repeat indefinitely this uh, uh, relationship between uh, performance in healthy controls and uh, and the difference that they have in their brain. And you can see here a summary uh, slide from the paper of, of Yannif Surf, uh, re published recently, where you have an arrow indicating uh, to you uh, the regions in the white matter that have been uh, related to inter-individual differences in uh, different tasks. And those include motor coordination, uh, in uh, the motor cortex, so more white matter there, better motor coordination, mental rotation in the uh, left uh, uh, intraparietal sulcus, um, posterior adaptation in the frontal pole, cognitive control in the prefrontal cortex, uh, creativity in the frontal lobe, uh, grammar learning, we spoke about this study, in the vicinity of the Broca area, you get more mental rotation bilaterally in the parietal lobe, lexical decision in the vicinity of the left parietal lobe, um, auditory comprehension in the vicinity of the left temporal lobe, 
uh, motivation in the singular, uh, singulum b manual coordination. This is a study that I mentioned in the corpus callosum. Reading in the posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus at the slice 20, we just spoke about that. Uh, grammar learning, again, that's the same in the vicinity of the Broca uh, uh, area. Openness in the uh, vicinity of the inferior frontal gyrus in the right hemisphere. And then visual uh, selection at the level of the optical radiation, optic radiation, introspection in the forceps major of the uh, uh, corpus callosum, this is slide 10, uh, as well as in the uh, posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus in the right hemisphere. Object recognition will be faster if you have a stronger uh, posterior um, forceps of the corpus callosum, major forceps of the corpus callosum. Again, reading, but that's for the inferior part of the posterior segment of the arcuate fasciculus, which is symmetrically organized, uh, symmetrically organized with uh, the expertise in piano. And then you have those uh, cerebellar, uh, superior cerebellar connections that will be uh, good for motor coordination. And that's the studies that we mentioned for the ballistic movement in a martial artist. All these studies are great. And as I said, they tackle how being different at the adult age is correlated, significantly associated with having a different brain, particularly in the white matter. But that doesn't tell us whether you are born this way or if this really happened uh, uh, along your acquisition of this skill. Um, and this is uh, a, a question that require you to uh, acquire data uh, in, in participants before and after they learn a new skill. It's been done by uh, Dragansky et al. Uh, they took participants who didn't know how to uh, uh, juggle and then they uh, scan them and they teach them to uh, how to juggle for uh, uh, two weeks. So they became very performant as juggling. So that, was their, that was their job, they were paid for that. And then they scanned them again when they were able to juggle and they made a comparison of their brain before and after learning to juggle. They made it into nature in 2004 and uh, you can see the areas um, when you're doing this, um, it's funny how they call it green matter, it's gray matter, it's probably a mistake. Um, when you're doing voxel-based morphometry, you look at change in the gray matter and you can see that uh, there is a strong change in the gray matter that is located bilaterally at the early occipital cortex and in the parietal lobe in the left hemisphere. And this percentage change uh, in the green matter compared to the first scan before uh, they learn to juggle and the second scan is like very significant as you can see in D. Then um, uh, the, same, uh, the same team, I remember like a similar team uh, extended this finding to the investigation of changes that occurred uh, related to the uh, um, learning of juggling, uh, not only in the gray matter, but also in the white matter using diffusion weighted imaging. And so they were able to show, and you can see it in blue, that in the vicinity of where your gray matter change, you also have white matter changes. Now, this is what I found as being like the first uh, study uh, revealing for the first time um, uh, change that occur in the brain, or that's primate brain, 
related to uh, training. Uh, and those changes are in the white matter, even though you see them in the gray matter, because it is axonal tracing that is made in monkey, uh, um, uh, controlling really uh, the tool use. Uh, so they, as they teach them how to use tool and to sacrifice them and look at whether you have differences between the participant uh, that uh, were not trained, the participants that were trained, and this is assuming that all monkeys brain uh, should be the same. And you can see that FC, FT1 and FT2, they're very different and FT2 actually was trained for uh, uh, learning the tool use. And you can see that the connections between his parietal lobe and his frontal lobe are uh, different. And the same can be found for uh, jugglers uh, in uh, this paper uh, published by Schultz et al, where you can see that, as I showed just before, as a white matter in the vicinity of the parietal lobe, probably connecting the frontal lobe, change with the acquisition of the skill of juggling. Now that's, that's really interesting in the way this is the first demonstration, these few papers, that this is not you who are born with a different brain that make you good or bad at things. It is you, according to what you're doing, what you decide to train for, that can change and modify your brain to be more performant at what you're doing. Um, and so that's uh, nicely uh summarize uh what uh, my and diamond said you got to use your brain or you're going to lose it um I'll, uh, i'm going to introduce you to another uh, study who uh, pushed this investigation a little further um, and because we can see here and every time we can see people acquiring a new knowledge but this takes weeks, you know, like uh, that can take five days, 10 days uh, uh, to learn a new, uh, a new knowledge, but we're able to learn much faster than that. How fast can we do that? Um, like this is actually one of my favorite papers. Uh, the paper from Sergi, from the team of Yanni Fasaf. Uh, in this paper, they, compared participants, um, they scanned them first and before they learn a new skill, and they compared the learning rate of uh, 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 participants by asking them to play a video game, which is uh, a race car driving. Um, and, and half of the participants are always doing the same circuits so they learn really uh, well the circuit and they're getting faster and faster and faster uh, at um, doing the race. And that will be the, uh, um, the rounded dots that you can see in the chart. According to the number of laps, they're gonna be faster and faster and faster at uh, doing the race compared to a second group that is doing a different circuits every time. And you can see that like, you know, they, there is no learning. They're getting a little faster because uh, they handle better the game, but it's very different from the increase of performance of the participants that are doing always the same circuit. And by doing so, you can try to look inside the brain just after an hour of uh, playing the game, uh, how, you know, if there is any mark or any change that occur inside the brain that will be related to repeating the same circuits all the time or doing a different circuit. So what they've been able to do is to compare uh, uh, the brain of uh, the participant doing the same circuit uh, several times with the participants doing a different circuit. And what they've been able to show is that you doing the same circuit uh, uh, several times, you have 
uh, uh, degrees of uh, mean diffusivity that occur inside your hippocampus more than if you're doing a different circuit all the time. And that is the comparison between A and B on the left of this slide. So if you're doing the same circuit all the time, the mean diffusivity in your brain will decrease uh, in the hippocampus more than if you're doing uh, a different circuit all the time. And this percentage of change in the mean diffusivity is proportional to how you're going to improve at the game, how fast are you going to do the circuit in the game. Um, this is really, really uh, strongly correlated that 50% uh, uh, of this change is related to the improvement of the game. This is amazing. Uh, just in a very little time, you play the game for one or two hours and you already have a change in your brain. But you might ask yourself, what is that change exactly? What does it correspond to in terms of biology? If you're asking yourself this question, this is the right question uh, for people doing uh, uh, cognitive neuroscience. We study human with magnetic resonance imaging. However, magnetic resonance imaging is not the true biology of the brain. It's an indirect measure of the biology of the brain. And there is still a huge gap between findings that we find with magnetic resonance imaging and true biological change in the brain. Uh, but this didn't stop the team of Saji and Asaf because they replicated this finding in another group of uh, participants that were mice. So of course you can't ask mice to play Need for Speed and uh, this like racing game. This is just uh, not possible. But you can ask them to do the what maze task where you drop your mice inside a pool of water with a hidden platform and the mice has to search for this platform. And you can uh, split your group in two, one group where the platform is always in the same place and they will learn really fast to go to the platform directly and increase their performance and one group where the platform is in a different place where they will learn a little bit but not as much as when it's always in the same place. You do that for a couple of hours, scan those mice with an MRI and you replicate the finding that uh, in the group that always had the platform in the same place, uh, there is a decrease of mean diffusivity in the hippocampus compared to the group that has always uh, the, um, uh, the uh, 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 platform in a different place. So maintaining the location of this uh, platform in the maze in two hours produced a change in mean diffusivity in the hippocampus of this mice. Very nice replication, but what's fascinating is you can study the biology of this change. And this is what it showed in a C, where you have different kind of staining um, that have been uh, uh, that have been made. Uh, so those are immunohistochemical image. You have uh, MAP two. Uh, synaptophysin at the scene, uh, GAFP and uh, BDNF. Um, so MAP2, uh, it's a, a microtubule associated protein to dendrites, will indicate to you whether you have more dendrites that actually uh, have been um, have been created uh, in the group L, which is the one that are always the same platform, and as uh, the group P, which will have always a different platform. And you can see that there is no real differences uh, between uh, those two. 
Um, with the synaptophysin, you actually can explore whether you have changes in the brain in the number of vesicles that are transmitted from one synapse to another. And uh, what you can see here, uh, that's a way to measure the chemical re reaction between you. So you can see that you have a slight increase that occur in the group that are always the same platform in the hippocampus, a slight increase of the number of, of vesicular exchange when you compare with a group that is always using a different platform. But the biggest change that you can find is for uh, the GFAP, which is a glial fibrillatic acidic protein that can characterize stain uh, glial cells inside the hippocampus. And here you can see how brighter is uh, the group that always had the same location for the platform compared to the group that had a different uh, place for the platform every time. And, um, and then uh, uh, the BDNF uh, is, uh, uh, it's a staining that will uh, characterize like a, a precursor protein for a uh, nerve growth factor which will be a precursor for uh, uh, so, uh, growing of connections somehow. And you can see as well that just after two hours, you have more of uh, BDNF staining in the mice that were always having the same location for the platform compared to LC control, to compared to the groups that had always a different uh, uh, platform. And this is a, uh, this is a fascinating comparison because it suggests that, you know, you don't have any change that occur in the brain that is related to the number of dendrites. You, you know, not creating connections really that fast in two hours in the brain. It doesn't happen, but you have a change uh, in the communication locally, which, okay, I can accept that, like more vesicles because this area is working more. So you have more uh, synaptic exchange through chemical uh, uh, release. Um, and this is clearly related to an increase of uh, presence of uh, the uh, glial cells, particularly the astrocytes, that is stained by the GFAP. And you can see here magnified in D, uh, you have small astrocyte in the group that use a different platform and they become bigger and more numerous uh, as uh, you are uh, in the group of uh, mice that always have the same location for the platform. And you already have a signal in the brain that indicates that you progressively and not right now, but it's gonna happen later, you're going to have a change in the connectivity, going to have growth of uh, nerve growth that's going to happen in this region uh, uh, later on to probably um, uh, imprint this knowledge or imprint part of this knowledge in this area through change of permanent change of, uh, of the connections. Now you can also have a look at those mice five days later. And five days later, the pattern of uh, uh, change, uh, you still have the hippocampus, but you also start having change inside the white matter, particularly in the corpus callosum, that where you can see that the intensity of the staining of axons in the corpus callosum is stronger after five days. Uh, in the group of uh, mice that always has the same platform uh, versus the one that always had a different platform. So things change in the brain, they change real fast and white matter, you know, those growing uh, uh, factors that we found uh, is already changed after five days. All this plasticity matters because this plasticity can be predictive 
of a different trajectory in your recovery after a stroke, for example. Uh, you have these studies that have been uh, published by Stephanie Fogel in 2014, where she's comparing stroke participants uh, that had their first stroke in the left hemisphere, come out of the stroke aphasic, and so not able to speak anymore. And what they've been trying, what, what she's been trying to do is to see whether uh, differences in the right hemisphere that has not been touched by the stroke can characterize uh, the recovery of uh, these participants six months after the stroke. And you can see that um, the aphasia quotient, which is uh, your performance in language, uh, in participants that were aphasic after the stroke, six months after the stroke, if they have a small arcuate fasciculus in the right hemisphere, they do not recover well. If they have a, a bigger arcuate fasciculus, which will be the brain in the middle, they tend to uh, recover uh, quite all right. And they have the very big arcuate fasciculus in the right hemisphere, and they recover completely after six months after the stroke. This is controlling for age, size of the lesion, and many other factors. So this really indicates that whether or not the shape and the size of the arcuate fasciculus was through training or through a, you know, a different genetic phenotype of your brain, this will not make you equal regarding to your resilience and your recovery to a given disease like stroke. The same logic can be applied for visual neglect. So for those of you who don't know about visual neglect, it's a syndrome where uh, participants lose completely the awareness of uh, uh, half of the world. So here, for example, I asked the participant to cancel all these uh, little uh, uh, bars on this piece of paper. And you can see how it's going to cancel it onto the right side of the piece of the paper, but it's never going to explore the left side of the piece of paper, uh, just because, not because he doesn't see it, it's because in its brain, it, the existence of that side completely disappeared. And so like in the video here, I've been particularly insistent. And you can see how it's just like, it doesn't do it. And I just find it fascinating. Wait, look, it's going to cancel a second time some of those bars, but it's never going to go on the left side. There's the left side according to him, of course. And that's done. See, this syndrome um, is often uh, uh, considered as a mirror syndrome to aphasia because it occurs as often after lesions in the right hemisphere that aphasia occur after lesion in the left hemisphere, which is about the asymmetry of function of the brain, which will be the subject matter of uh, my next lecture I will record for you. If you uh, compare uh, uh, participants who uh, uh, have this syndrome with participants uh, who do not have this syndrome, uh, you can see that you have change in the white matter uh, um, that occur uh, in the uh, corpus callosum and the frontal parietal uh, cortex, and that will be uh, the uh, C, uh, and that would be in C at the bottom of this slide. But really, uh, uh, 
what's, what might be of interest is comparing people that used to have a visual negligence and they recovered from their negligence. And you compare it with people that didn't have a negligence and you realize that they have increased their white matter in the external capsule and in the internal capsule of the brain. So you have this plasticity that happened in the brain, this change that happened and has been related to uh, the recovery of visual negligence. Um, the same logic can be applied to uh, 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 visual neglect and extinction, uh, this time by uh, comparing uh, the acute stage with the chronic stage MRI scan. And if you do so, you do find changes that occur inside the white matter in the same hemisphere as the stroke and in the control lesion, lesional hemisphere. And this is really the brain trying to compensate for this injury to maintain a functioning that is adapted to the environment. Now, you know, like uh, you have a, a distribution of function for language and space that is uh, 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 spread among the two hemispheres, even though there is a dominance of one hemisphere over the other. Um, uh, and what happened when you have a, a, a lesion is that you, for a little time, you're going to try to compensate with the control lesional hemisphere and hopefully with a longer time, your uh, damage hemisphere will uh, take over once it is repaired. It's a little bit like uh, when you break your car, your car will be your right hemisphere and you'd have a stroke in there, bring it to the garage, it, uh, uh, give you another car for the time being, hopefully if you have a good insurance, and that will be your left hemisphere so you can still drive, and then when the car is repaired, you can get it back. Um, and that would be your right hemisphere again. And that's a little bit what's happening in the brain. And we try to uh, represent here on the right side of the slide, where you can see that you have a functional damage, um, which can recover uh, a long time. And time is going from the left to the right, from acute to acute chronic, and several months after the stroke. And you can see that for motor deficit, you have a faster recovery at the beginning and it flattened a little bit after uh, six months after your stroke. While for high level cognitive deficits, it's more linear uh, progression of recovery of your deficit. Then if you go at the lower level, you'll see that after your uh, acute stroke, you're going to have an increase of fMRI activity in the control lesional hemisphere in blue uh, that is uh, taking over the activity uh, uh, over the ipsilesional hemisphere, which is the hemisphere in which you have a lesion. And then at the chronic stage, you have a crossing where the ipsilesional hemisphere is going to work again and, and take over the uh, function and release, relieve uh, the uh, uh, control lesional hemisphere from this kind of double task of taking over uh, all the function. This is uh, going together with a glial reaction. Oh, we know now that the glial reaction is very important uh, to uh, the plasticity and uh, uh, the recovery mechanism in the brain. Um, and you can see that you have first a very strong glial reaction in the control lesional hemisphere, followed later on with a glial reaction in the ipsy lesional hemisphere. And the same goes for the creation of new synapses that first, just first, start with the control lesional hemisphere, followed up by the ipsy lesional hemisphere. And axonal sprouting have been reported in squirrel monkeys. They've been reported at 
uh, the uh, very chronic uh, stage, several months after the injury, uh, they're not there at the acute stage, uh, but we have no idea what is the dynamic and what's happening in the control agent hemisphere for this measure. So you see how you have this kind of a cascade of different events happening inside the brain after an injury of your brain trying to compensate uh, and uh, reorganize its functioning to optimize your survival uh, and, and the quality of your interaction with your environment. But, you know, even if uh, you uh, don't have a stroke, your brain will have to cope with a progressive damage that happened with aging. Uh, because with aging, you have neuronal loss and small vexillary alterations that lead to the progressive white matter damage. And this is associated with a cognitive decline in elderly. That's just the way it is. So you have uh, this uh, cascade of events uh, from this uh, small vessel alteration. And I circle um, uh, in red uh, all the particular events that will definitely have an effect on the white matter, such as the apoptosis of the oligodendrocytes, so your myelination is going to uh, decrease. Uh, you're going to have ischemia that will disconnect tracks. Uh, in fact, the same way will uh, also damage your axon, um, necrosis of the white matter, and then you can see that on in diffusion MRI uh, and in flare or T1 eventually, but really diffusion MRI will be the most sensitive for uh, this measurement. If you're looking at aging, uh, apparently cognitive decline should affect in priority uh, executive uh, functions. And this brain change related to aging seems to distribute really unevenly, uh, uh, damaging predominantly uh, the frontal region of the brain. Uh, so here on the left, you have an example of a task that is going to get uh, worse as you aging, which is a TMT task where you have to uh, link with a pen as a number one with a letter A and alternate to the number two with a letter B and number three with a letter C, number four with a letter D, number five with a letter E, and so on and so forth. Okay? And as you aging, um, really the speed with which you're going to achieve this task, which is a TMT, um, uh, is going to increase, like the speed it's going to decrease. You're going to take more and more time to do it. And uh, so your performance is going to decrease. And uh, yeah, that's about it. The question is, um, and that's an executive function. And we know executive function are mostly related to uh, networks that involves the frontal lobe. And that suggests the frontal lobe will, should be uh, one of the first you are the fastest to decline in the brain. Um, and, you know, preliminary findings suggest that this is true. If you look at white matter tracks, like the portion that is in the frontal lobe seems to be more damaged than the portion that is not. And you can see clearly here, like the red part is the part that is the most significantly associated with aging. The blue part is as the one that is the less significantly associated with aging. Um, this is true for most, but not, not necessarily all, because different mechanisms uh, uh, can, uh, uh, can occur according to people. And um, so if you can see, for example, here, functional activation, uh, during a specific task in young on the top, um, you can see that if you do the same task in uh, a, a participant with a low education level on the left, you have the same pattern of activity uh, than the young, uh, uh, although the activity seems stronger and the performance is worse. 
who are actually a participant with a higher level of education, and they will be on the right. Uh, they have a different pattern of activation and their performance is quite comparable. So it looks like according to your level of education, uh, you have a form of cognitive reserve, which is characterized by you not showing decrease of performance, uh, uh, very significant decrease like, or lower decrease of performance compared to uh, young uh, participants. You're definitely doing better than the one with a lower level of education. And also a different pattern of activity. So you're using your brain differently. And this is uh, what we will call uh, the cognitive reserve. And so, like, the question was uh, whether or not uh, uh, the level of education will change the uh, white matter uh, decline. And that, that was unknown. So we tried to investigate that. We looked at all the tracks that are connecting the frontal lobe. You have here a, a, a depiction of those track. You have the frontal association track, uh, such as the SLF on the top left, one, two, and three. You have the cingulum in four, the ancinate in five, uh, the arcuate long segment in six, the short entire segment in seven, the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus in eight. Uh, you also have the left frontal lobes that speak with the right frontal lobes through commercial track, and that will be number nine. You have a full system of projection to the frontal lobe, including 10, which is a corticospinal track, 12, which is, uh, uh, sorry, 11, which is uh, anti-thalamic radiation, 12, which will be the corticostriatal uh, system of uh, connections, and uh, 13, which will be the frontal pontine fibers. And then you don't have to go that far to interact in the frontal lobe. You also have short U-shaped fibers between the precentral and the postcentral uh, gyri, which would be 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, you have direct connection between the parsopercularis and the medial uh, uh, frontal lobe, particularly the SMN, pre-SMN, that will be 19. And you get short connection between the inferior frontal gyrus and the insula, which will be 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. And within the frontal lobe, you have intralobar connection between the posterior part and the anterior part, which we call frontal superior longitudinal 25, frontal inferior longitudinal 26. And in the frontal pole, you have a, a, a connection between the lateral and the medial frontal pole, which would be the frontal marginal track at 28, and the ventral posterior and ventral anterior uh, frontal lobe, which will be uh, uh, um, the orbitopolar connections, frontal orbitopolar connections as up. Um, so like the first thing that we try to look at is that like, are, is really like the shape of those tracks changing with time. Um, so we created average map of this shape and we can see that they pretty much look the same. And if we run like a correlation uh, between decades, you can see that the correlation do not really decrease with time. So that suggests that the anatomy of your track is not being modified at the macro scale uh, with age. And then we try to look at whether the microstructure, so the way where the molecule diffuse inside the track is related to age. And if you do that, well, we didn't find any differences uh, between uh, uh, highly educated and people with a lower education, knowing that they were all educated because you know, uh, 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 difficult to find people that didn't go at school at all in France. Um, because school is mandatory. So it's, it, it, there was no difference between people that really went to the university to a high level and people who didn't go to the university. So white matter was not significantly uh, different. But there was some clear correlation uh, with age 
uh, that showed that uh, with age, you have a slow uh, decrease of the white matter uh, uh, integrity in those frontal connections. And uh, so you can see, and this, lin this decrease is linear. You can find it in the uh, frontal connections, but you can find it also in the uh, connection connecting different lobe in the right hemisphere and small connection in the left hemisphere, suggesting that the process of aging in the brain of the white matter connection is not the same between the right and the left hemisphere. So we've seen that uh, brain change occur from the birth to uh, the late aging of your brain, that you can still change your brain when you are an adult, and that can character, be characterized by a different performance uh, task. So if you become an expert, you will uh, progressively change your brain so that you are better at what you do. Next lecture will be about brain asymmetry. I strongly encourage you to watch our symposium that is now available online um, on our YouTube channel. It is about structural connectivity of the cerebral cortex. And you can join us every Monday morning from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. Paris time, grab a coffee and discuss with us very interesting that science that happened in the last week, and we call that the Norochino. Quick word about the exam or the evaluation of your performance to this module. Um, the part A of the module, which I'm responsible for, uh, the score of your performance to the part A of the module will be averaged with uh, the score of your performance in the part B, which is uh, taught by Professor Valesi. Uh, for my part, your uh, performance uh, and your evaluation, your grade, if you want, will be derived from uh, your attendance during the practical session combined with your participation in class. So I know that due to uh, the um, situation, we cannot interact directly, but you can leave comment on YouTube or on the um, uh, Neurostar Forum. Um, and I'm going to ask you to do a little project where you are asked to write an essay on a brain hierarchy, the so brain hierarchy of your choice. Choose one that you're interested with and write to me a text divided in five sections that will be a total of so five sections together of 1,500 to 2,500 words, um, not including uh, the reference at the end. So that's uh, really you writing 1,500 to 2,500 words. And I want those sections to be divided, um, the, those five sections to correspond to a general introduction where you get me excited about uh, your, the brain hierarchy of your choice. Uh, it needs to be interesting. Um, that another section when you describe the anatomy of this hierarchy, uh, where are the key players in there? Uh, then another section where you discuss whether or not this hierarchy is lateralized in the brain. And if not, if you don't find any report of lateralization of this hierarchy, how would you investigate it? Mm -hmm. Be creative. Um, then I'd like you to link this hierarchical uh, this hierarchy with brain evolution. Uh, how did that happen? Why is it, um, why is it like this? Uh, uh, I just would like you to uh, link it up with uh, brain evolution. And then you have a synthesis, a part of your manuscript when you put together the anatomy, its lateralization and its link with uh, brain evolution. I want this essay sent to me uh, before midnight, December 11th, to my personal email, michel.thiebo at gmail.com. With this, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be uh, happy to answer to your question on the YouTube channel. Thank you.